Welcome to the Business Speak Podcast, where we take everything you need to know about being successful in business and make it easy to understand. Whether you're a longtime business owner, newer to this entrepreneur stuff, or hoping to run your own company in the future, you've come to the right place. Featuring your host, professional accountant and business guru, Mr. Chill. So relax and have some fun with us as we journey through business speak, the language of business simplified. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Business Speak podcast. I'm your host, Mr. Chill. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I have as a special guest for us today, uh, Mr. Frank Gannon. Frank, you want to say hi? Good morning, Corey. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to have Frank here. Now, the topic of our discussion today, our conversation today, is going to flow into something that is arguably one of the most important things to figure out inside of a business. Now, that's a pretty bold statement because we've already covered a lot of important topics and there's many we haven't touched on yet. But I think it's safe to say that if a company does not have this particular thing figured out, they're not going to last very long. And so today we're talking about the concept of sales. And so in a business, in any kind of business really, if you want to be more profitable, if you want to make more money, there's two options that you have. You can either increase your revenue, the income coming in, or you can cut back on the spending the money going out. I dare say it's probably more fun to enjoy an opportunity to grow the money coming in. And so that is where Frank is going to provide some wonderful counsel and insight today. I'd like to introduce Frank to all of you that are listening and are watching. He's got a pretty impressive background that I think will help give some uh, credence to why I've invited him to come on today. So let me read you a little bit from his website. By the way, Frank is the founder of a company called FTR Sales Consultants. I've been running for a few years now, and that's after many, many years in sales. So uh, let me give you a little background and bio that you can find on his website. Frank has spent the past 20 years as a sales professional in the software industry in Canada. Most notably, Frank spent 11 years at a Fortune 200 human capital management company where he began his career as an individual contributor, rising through the ranks to Vice President of Sales. Frank also held regional responsibility for the Internet of Things team at Canada's leading telecommunications company. Prior to starting FTR, Frank was the Vice President of Global Sales for an upstream oil and gas software provider. I'm going to go off script here for a second. FTR, the acronym in Frank's company that he's founded, has a really cool meeting, which we'll get into in a minute. I won't spoil it yet. Frank completed his MBA in 2011. His firsthand experience around the internal challenges and opportunities bringing to market new products and services led him to focus on implementing organizational change as his core area of study. Frank has the unique ability to quickly determine how a product or service links directly to an organization's strategic growth plan and then sets about proving how a product or service solves a business problem that is impeding the strategy of his customer's company. Frank is a process-driven sales executive who firmly believes that without process, a sales organization cannot duplicate year-over-year profitable growth. Okay, here's the spoiler. He has a track (laughs) record of increasing sales and achieving faster time to revenue, thus FTR, faster time to revenue. So there you go. There's the spoiler alert on what FTR stands for. I'll give Frank in a moment a chance to talk about how that came to be. Frank's personal, is that pronounced key? Yeah, key or chi. Chi translates as a confident, committed, and caring professional with an ongoing desire to provide superior service. Now that's what's officially on his bio. Now I've known Frank for a while. I know some of his family. He comes from a great family who are very successful in their chosen fields. And I've been working with Frank for a while, and I think you're going to love hearing from him today and milking on all of these years of experience he has in sales. Now, on his website, and I think in his email signature, he has this short quote, and I kind of read a piece of it, but here's what it says. It says, without process, 
You cannot duplicate success. And so I imagine, among other things we're going to get to in this episode, Frank will probably touch upon that. You bet. Now, Frank, um, first of all, what's missing in the bio I noticed is, and if you want to share anything, you can. If not, that's okay. What do you do outside of your business life, outside of helping business owners increase their sales and companies grow their sales? What does Frank do for fun? What is Frank's hobbies? Well, okay. Well, again, thanks for having me, Corey. Um, several hobbies, obviously uh, an avid skier, especially after spending 20, 20 some years living in the city of Calgary, the mountains were close. So uh, uh, took on the, the love of skiing. Um, also enjoy mountain biking. Um, my wife and I are big dog fans. So we, uh, we have uh, always had golden retrievers. So we like spending time with our, with our dogs and uh, currently, we have a, a golden retriever. His name is Enzo. Enzo. And so he's quite a character, and we just love spending time with him on walks and off-leash parks. And um, One of the other passions that I have is, uh, and, and I'm pleased to be a part of, is the Ferrari community. Mm-hmm. So you're nodding your head. Yeah, so he I... He likes collecting cool cars. <laughs> yeah, particular the particular brand I'm passionate about, my wife and I are passionate about, is, uh, is the Ferrari brand. Um, and some people may look at that and kind of wonder, well, what does that mean? And, um, you know, we've always loved the brand that we've always found their, their cars to be very beautiful. But one of the things that really, really hit us was when we, uh, were invited to take a tour of the factory in Marinello, Italy. Mm. And what I saw or came away from that tour was, uh, humility, uh, pride and excitement about the future. It That's wasn't cool. arrogance or or what you might expect to see at a place like that. So, um, and then fortunately for the last three years, I have been the regional director of the Ferrari Club of America. So I've, one of, I've, I've been one of 15 uh, board members for the Ferrari Club of America. I've since taken a, uh, a, seat, a step back. Um, a fellow out of Vancouver has uh, taken over my role. Great guy named Gary Sandberg. And uh, I'm now a regional director emeritus. So okay. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I'm staying connected and, and that's fantastic. So so real quickly, what does the Ferrari Club of America do? What's its like mission statement there? That's a good question. Uh, I'm, okay. not sure okay. that I can, I'm not sure that I can rattle off the mission statement, but what it's about is it's about bringing people together that are, that are passionate about the brand. Um, it's about you know, meeting uh, like people you know, husbands, wives, partners, uh, you know, just conducting various events such as drives to the mountains, uh, if you're in Western Canada, uh, to weekly coffee and cars, just uh, being part of that community. So the Ferrari Club of America is uh, obviously North America wide. Um, it's overseen uh, by Ferrari of Marinello. They keep a real good close eye on us, uh, make sure we're, we're not abusing the brand. Um, okay. uh, obviously that makes sense. Um, currently we have about 7,500 members across North America. So it's a a pretty fun, fun organization to be a part of. It's, it's really a family. So in addition to Frank's uh, passion and expertise in sales, he's passionate about cars, particularly Ferrari. He and his wife love dogs in particular. Now, those of you that have listened to this podcast or have gotten to know me or get to know me, you'll know that I'm a big Disney fan. And I can't think of the word Ferrari without thinking of some priceless scenes from the movie Cars. Um, so I'm not going to quote them because I'll probably misquote them. But if, you, if you're at all interested in Ferrari in particular and really nice cars, you should watch the Disney movie and Cars. And it kind of reminds me of that. I'll have to watch the movie. You haven't seen it yet? I have not seen it. Oh, you've got to watch it. I think you'll, you'll love it even more because there's a whole, like, devotion in one particular town area to Ferrari. So okay. I think you'd like that. Okay. Now, there's a couple of things in your bio that caught my attention. You might get to them eventually, but let's sure. go back to one we already talked about for a second. So sure. after several years of kind of realizing you had a passion and a skill set in sales and helping other people achieve that um, metric, that area of their business, you started this company you called FTR. And as I mentioned earlier, and as it says in your bio, it's the acronym is Faster Time to Revenue. You maybe take a minute and just give us a little bit of historical background or 
insight into why you started this company and why you named it that? Sure. Um, and <clears throat> the Fortune 200 company that's referenced in my bio is, uh, is ADP. Okay. Uh, so this is a New, Jer- New Jersey-based software as a service company in the human capital management space. Primarily, ADP is known for its ADP, its payroll services. Yeah. So um, I was blessed to spend almost 12 years at ADP. And after leaving ADP, I went to a couple of smaller companies in about the $20 million range. And um, much to my surprise, uh, these companies didn't have any sales processes or systems to drive predictable growth. And they were just sort of flying by the seat of their pants. So. Um, so spending time at those companies and implementing processes and systems, for example, a defined multi-step sales process, um, you've, we, I found that revenue came into the company faster. Okay. So thus faster time to revenue. So when you have defined sales processes and systems and you adhere to those uh, in your client engagements, typically we see faster time to revenue. So re- the sale occurring faster, revenue into the business faster. Cool. Now, in full disclosure, and I've 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 known Frank and his company for a few years now. I honestly thought it was some play on his name because his first yeah. name is Frank, and I'm like F T. Maybe there's some middle names in there. I a wasn't middle really names sure. There. Yeah. So I learned this morning, along with you, that uh, listening that uh, F T R stands for Faster Time to Revenue. So I think that's a pretty appropriate name based on what Frank does. So Frank, maybe then on that note, maybe just take another moment. I'm pitch for your company if you want, but just what does your company do? What is your company's objective? When you go into a potential client, what is the goal you're trying to help them achieve? Yeah, I mean, at a very high level, it's about helping them increase year over year revenue growth. And typically we see anywhere between 50 and 70, 50 and, or 20 and 50% uh, revenue growth year over year. Um, so really, you know, where we're coming from is, is a place of, of helping. Um, and that really comes from the time I spent after ADP seeing these smaller companies that had great products, some of, some being the best in their industry, but they're just sort of struggling along. So it's really uh, about being passionate about helping these companies. It's not necessarily about the money or the fees charged at this point. Okay. Now, I'm not sure exactly where you want to take this, but I have a... <laughs> A comment that may be shared among some people listening, at least, sometimes when I think of a salesman, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I get this picture of this less than ethical dude. Yes. We'll, we'll stereotypically call it a guy. Yes. <laughs> it could be a female, but often or not, it's a guy. <clears throat> Maybe they work in a used car sales dealership, Yeah. and they're trying to pull a wall over your eyes and trying to sell you something that's not what it's pretended to be, or seems to be a better deal than it actually is, or there's something fundamentally wrong with it, they're not disclosing. And I know that that's a wrong, terrible stereotype, but i probably Mm -hmm. not the only one that doesn't necessarily have a fond picture in my head when you think of a salesperson. And so sometimes because of that, when I I, I sometimes say, well, I'm definitely not a salesperson, not just because I'm not that good at it, but just because that's not the way I would operate. Obviously, that's not an accurate depiction of what real professional salespeople would look like. But so why do you think that that has sort of become a stereotype? Why, why, does, why do salespeople get a bad rap? That's a really good question. <laughs> it could be a very long answer. Um, here's, here's my view on this. So... Um, at a high level, if, if, if a salesperson is trying to sell you something, um, then it probably feels like they're trying to sell you something. So uh, my view is that if, if a sales professional takes the approach of how can I serve, how can I help, how can I solve a business problem, that's the way to go. And that's the more effective way uh, a salesperson can you know achieve their targets. So in other words, if if you come across a salesperson that's trying to sell you something, it feels that way. But you can tell the big difference when you come across a sales uh, a sales professional that's trying to help you help you solve a a, a, a business problem. And you know that's why I go back to you know to a, a multi a multi step sales process that I referenced earlier in our yeah. conversation. So a multi step sales process really seeks to under under 
uh, understand what the business problem is, you know, obviously establish rapport and trust, and then at the end of that multi-step process, clearly demonstrate how your product or service is going to solve the business problem. And so you, you would view it more as meeting a need, helping them solve their problem, 100%. than please buy my product, please 100%. buy my service. Hundred percent, because if you're if you're trying to sell somebody something, you're you're not any different than the salesman down the road, or a commercial on TV. Hundred percent. So, yeah. So you're really really seeking to demonstrate how you and your your product or service can add value and solve a business problem. Okay. Now I'm going to challenge you a little bit, maybe. Please do. <laughs> I think you, you have had amazing success working with larger organizations who have big teams and possibly big budgets to be able to devote resources and time and money to developing a sales process, to hiring someone like yourself or even a whole team of people like yourself to come help them solve that problem. If a lot of the people listening to this podcast are mom and pop shop type <clears throat> businesses, they're just them and or a significant other, maybe they have a family business that's just a couple people. They don't have the money and the resources to have big teams to implement big systems. How do how do those people get started? How, how do those people grow their sales when they may not have the vast resources of a larger size company? Great question. Um, and it's really no, no different than what we do when we go into a, a 10 or $20 million company today when FTR goes into a, one of those companies today. And it really starts with uh, establishing um, what, what their value proposition is, what their value statement is. So that should be established early on, whether you're a, a one man or a one person company or a mom and pop company, because uh, what we find was, is when we go into 10, 20, 30 million dollar companies, that hasn't been established. Hmm. So that's one of the first things that we, we help our clients do. So the point is, is getting in front of that early, clearly uh, you know, working it through. Uh, through a, we, we typically do a, a flip charting type exercise with our clients. You can do that if you're a mom and, mom and pop company. And really getting down to, you know, what is our value statement? So the, the value statement is um, what's unique about our company, important to our clients, and is defensible with data. So if we think about FTR, uh, FTR's value is, well, you're getting a, a, a former Fortune 200 VP of sales for a fraction of the cost. So if my street value is $400,000 and you're getting me one day a week for $5,000 a month, that's the value of FTR, right? Uh, Fortune 200 VP is sales for a fraction of the cost. Okay. So I don't know very many for, uh, former uh, VPs of sales from Fortune 200 companies here at Edmonton or, or Alberta. So. Uh, okay. I have a feeling that three that three uh, item list you just mentioned is going to be pretty relevant and important for people. So just just so we can repeat, I think we got to repeat things that are relevant and uh, important sure. to emphasize. <clears throat> that list of three things again that you were saying just a moment ago. Can you just repeat it one more time for everyone that's listening? Yeah. So what's unique to your company or your service? What's important to your potential clients or customers and is defensible. And what do you mean by defensible? Defensible with data. So for example, um, I'll go back to my ADP days. We had a 98% a uh, client retention rate. And you know we could we could put that out there uh, to the market in our value statement, but we also had the data to prove it. That if somebody said, "Well, how can you, how how do you know that?" Well, we would actually track client retention. So if need be, I could present that data to the company to the potential client. So defensible, because the rest of that thing is by data. You're right. That's right. That's what you said. Yeah. Okay. That's so right. You have the data to back up the sure. claim that you're making. So gotcha. so I'll, I'll take it a step further, Corey. Um, FTR has a, a local roofing company, and their value statement uh, speaks to their HomeStars rating. Uh, now, you may be f familiar with HomeStars, right? Yeah. Um, so that's third-party data. They're not creating that data on their own. So if a client says to them, well, what do you mean you, you rate highest in in reputation and responsiveness. Well, well, we do. Here's the website, the Homestars website. You can go and do your own search and you'll see that that third part, party data is there. We didn't create it. Okay. 
So what's unique <clears throat> to you, what's important to your customers, and what's defensible by or supported by the data. That's right. Okay. So again, we're going to spend some time today focusing on your kind of new startup or your smaller business. But sure. what we're going to talk about, I think, and you correct me if I'm wrong, will have relevance to a company of potentially any size. You bet. So if I've just started a company or I'm thinking about starting a company, and it's probably just going to be me, maybe I'll have one partner, maybe I'll have an, one employee, I don't know, but chances are it may just be me. I'm the sales guy. I'm the HR. I'm yeah. marketing. I'm yeah. everything. Yeah. So when I start this business, I'm, I'm trying to figure out a couple of things. One is how am I going to attract a clients and customers to come and actually like do business with me? Mm -hmm. And maybe an important sort of related topic is how do I price what I'm offering? Um, I, I find a lot of times that people are tempted by the bargain basement approach yeah. of I'm going to charge super cheap because <clears throat> that's going to what's going to attract people to me. And then, well, snap, I'm realizing that I really can't work that cheap or I'm worth more, but I don't know how to then raise my price or a client might think I pulled a wall over their eyes because I snuck them in at X price and now I'm charging them Y price or whatever. Yeah. So. I know there's probably a couple of questions in there. I'll let you decide how you want to take that. But I'm a new business owner. I'm ready to start my business or just started. My, I'm concerned about attracting people so I can pay my bills. Got it. And I'm trying to figure out how to price my product or service. What, what kind of steps or counsel or advice would you give to someone in that kind of stage? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Um, I, I would say this, um, and, and you, you, you'd kind of guide me if I'm if I'm going in the wrong direction here, Corey. But um, I would do what I did, um, and I came to a new city here in Edmonton and started at FTR. So I took a multi-pronged approach. So I joined a business group. Now I didn't think, oh my gosh, if I join that business group, clients will fall all, all over me because they didn't. But it was my way of getting out and, and, and networking in the city of Edmonton. Okay. Um, uh, like it or not, you've got to hunt. You've got to prospect potential uh, clients. Um, you've got to have defined prospecting metrics in place. You know, maybe it's 20 calls or a week in five face-to-face -face meetings, something like that, that you have to track versus sort of a seat-of-the-pants seat approach. Um, and then you can market your business uh, relatively inexpensively. That's, that's what I did. Uh, um, I had a website created um, by a, a company in Calgary, and it was I think it was three or four thousand dollars. So, I think those are the starting points. I think what's important is also to have a vision and a plan uh, of how you're not going to be the HR person, the finance person, the sales person. Because again, I'll go back to some of our clients in the ten, twenty, thirty million space. Uh, that still is happening. We call that many hats syndrome. Okay. So you have so this that's person. an identifiable yeah. thing. So you have this person that started out as an individual company or a mom and pop or a husband and wife, whatever, but they they didn't have that vision, so they're still wearing many hats. And when it comes to the driving revenue, there's just been no focus on doing it because they don't have enough time to do it. Mm -hmm. There just isn't enough hour. There aren't enough hours in the day. Um, does that answer your, your question on that one? Yeah, it does. Um, but let's take that one step further. Sure. So, one, um, so if I'm trying to figure out how to price my products and sure. services, um, I mean, I can take a variety of approaches. And again, I would defer to you in this. But one approach that I think is tempting and a lot of people go down is, well, if I charge what I feel I'm worth, nobody's going to come. So I feel pressure to charge bargain basement, seducement-like level pricing to get people in the door. Is that advisable to avoid or does that have its proper place? Or what is your view yeah. on that approach? Yeah, I think it's a good question. Um, you know, I come from a place of selling value and solving problems. So going in um, at a, a bargain basement uh, price, I don't think is the answer because then you're, you're all of a sudden dropping yourself into a space where you're effectively a commodity and it's a, what we call a race to the bottom on pricing, mm -hmm. right? And that hurts the top line, uh, top line revenue. So 
uh, my recommendation would be, and we do this today with our clients, but my recommendation would be what I did with FTR. Again, coming to a new city, I didn't know anybody or, or it's been, it had been many years. Uh, um, it's asking people in your business group, your peers, your colleagues, hey, I think I'm going to go to market with this type of pricing model. What do you think? Or even going to potential clients and saying, how does that, how does that feel you? to you? Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, sorry. I, yeah, that's the approach that I, I take, would take. Uh, I think that I went to market um, fairly with FTR um, to establish itself here, here in the, in the Edmonton region. But I mean, that monthly fee three years ago is not the same fee it is today because my clients have come back. One of my clients came back and said, you should have probably charged us a couple more thousand dollars a month. And I went, okay. <laughs> okay. That's good. That's good to know. It's good feedback to get. May not be a common <clears throat> thing you'd hear from a client, but probably a welcome thing to hear from a client. Right. Right. So when when uh, FTR brought on, recently brought on another another consultant, um, he is now going to market at you know significantly higher than than I did when I started FTR. So, and I think you said <clears throat> something a moment ago that's probably crucial in this whole thought process is you if you price yourself low, so low especially, people will view you as a commodity. And you're only as popular until the next cheapest option comes along. So you mentioned a moment ago about focusing on providing value. That's right. right. So not price value. And I don't know if this is accurate. I heard a quote once. I don't know where it came from, so I wish I could tell you where it's from. But it said something to the effect of people are not necessarily price sensitive. They're value sensitive. And mm -hmm. so if you think that you need to raise or lower your prices because people are not coming, it may just, no matter what you charge, they may not be seeing the value in what you provide and they may not be as price sensitive as you think they are as they just want to know that they're going to pay more for you, which they might be willing to do. They see the value in that, the value that you bring. Would you agree with that? Is that yep. fair? Yep, 100%. And I would just add to that, if you're going to go to market with that, uh, that value focus, you have to show how you're demonstrating value and thus thus a sales process, uh, a multi-step sales process has to be in place so that you have the opportunity to, to demonstrate how you add value. Um, I'll, use, I'll use a client of ours. Um, they're a residential roofing company. Okay. And who would have thought that they would have a sales process? Well, their problem was, uh, this is a, a small company, less than 10 people at the time. Their problem was they would they would go, they knew they were good, they knew they were knowledgeable, they knew they had tremendous value, uh, but they would go quote on a residential roof job and end up in what I call these three bids and a buy scenario, where you'd have a cheaper uh, offer come in and then often they were losing. Uh, mm. So what we did there was we established a defined sales process and we stick to it. Uh, and through that process, we're demonstrating how we add value. and. This, I thought, would be a bit of a struggle in a B2C, a business-to-consumer business, because I come from a business-to-business, -business, as you know, but uh, it wasn't. Uh, the, same, the same, you know, things apply. People want to, you know, they'll pay for value, but the, we need to demonstrate what value is. Okay. So I don't want to spoil all the beans, but how would a person go about demonstrating their value? You alluded to earlier, we talked about that this one company was using a third party, like Homestars. That, yes. So it's not just take my word for it, we're good. It's look at the reviews we've got on yep. this third party site. You potentially could use Google in a similar fashion. Sure. Saying, okay, look yep. at the, the Facebook or Google reviews we've had. You know, 150 people rate us five stars and a variety of things. So it's not just us saying take our word for it. We've got you know, data to back That's it right. up. But how do you prove your value to a potential client? Um, that's a you know that's a great question, and I think it's it's by it's by getting face time with your clients and 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 having meaningful discussions with them, and then from my perspective, that value just naturally comes out. Uh, I'll I'll go back to a, to our roofing company client. We've got a, a service manager there that is extremely extremely knowledgeable his sales calls often take an hour but he wins almost every time because people are hearing 
that yes, he's got knowledge, he knows what he's doing, I can trust this individual to do this repair on my roof uh, or my bu- my building envelope. So again, I, I go back to uh, to having a defined sales process where you have the opportunity to get FaceTime with the decision makers. Mm-hmm. In the roofing industry, it's often you know, a husband and a wife or a husband and a husband or whatever. Um, but it's imperative that we get FaceTime with the decision maker or makers um, so that we can demonstrate how we can how we add value and solve their problem. But you said something else there that I find intriguing. Um, at least this is how I would view it. So not only did, was this particular person spending an hour or more on the phone with just one potential client, um, so not only does that demonstrate that they're knowledgeable and that they know what they're doing, yeah. it also, to me, means that they care enough that at the moment they're talking to me, I'm the most important thing on their mind. That's right. Right? They're not like, okay, well, when is this meeting going to end? Or they're not like, okay, well, you're one of 15,000 people i got to reach out to today, so hurry up and get off this call. Yeah. There's, there's, there's that I care factor that I feel like goes into when you spend that much time with a potential client that I think is hard to quantify, but would probably also contribute to someone's desire to work with you. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, some, some folks uh, listening to the podcast may go, oh my gosh, that's, that's an, an hour. That's a lot uh, to, to, you know, conduct a, an initial call, uh, a service-related call on a residential home. But what we're actually finding, you know, people will pay for value. So in the case of this gentleman, we, we actually tell the clients up front that there's going to be a diagnostic fee uh, that we're going to charge you to have this individual come out. And at first, you know, people within the organization were going, we can't charge a diagnostic fee. Like, we're not (laughs) going to get any business. Well, guess what? We charge a diagnostic fee for Pete to go out and make residential uh, calls. Yeah. That's kind of a cool concept. Because the person up front... Um, you know, taking the inbound calls is able to clearly articulate the value of the company and the value of Pete so that people will go, okay, I'm, I'm up for that diagnostic fee. I mean, it's not a million dollars. I think it's about $200. But um, if they're not, if they're not interested in paying the diagnostics fee, maybe we don't want them as a client. Well, and that segues perfectly into yes. one of the things that... <laughs> I know I struggle with, at least have struggled with over the years, and I'm sure is like a crucial dilemma for every business, especially possibly one that's starting out or is just finding cash flow to be tight. Mm -hmm. So along with the temptation to bargain price our services is often probably a similar temptation to say yes to anyone and everyone that might possibly want to use us. And I feel like that's probably not the best approach, as you said, a client that does not align with what you offer or the way you want to offer it, or as Simon Sinek might say, it doesn't believe what you believe. Yeah. Not every sale is a good sale. At least I, I'm going agreed. to run that way. Yeah, right? agreed. And so, but when you're first starting out and it's like, okay, I have a business, but I have a mortgage and I have a family and plumbing, please come because I got to make my bills this month. It's very tempting to say, oh, you want to work with me? Okay, please, yes. I'll say yes to you and yes to you and yes to you and I'll say yes to a hundred of you even though I probably don't really align well with half of you just because I need the money, right? Yeah. So that requires a different sort of perspective and mindset, I think. And so what what kind of counsel or just yeah? how would you respond I'll, to someone I'll, who feels that pressure? I'll respond in a couple of ways. So I'll start with, with FTR when it was quite young. I took on a client um, that quite frankly wasn't engaged. In, in, in working with me to help help uh, drive their top line revenue. Um, quite frankly, I, I was greedy and I kept them on as a client. And, you know, looking back, um, that probably, they probably weren't the, weren't the happiest uh, client and it probably wasn't great for the FTR brand. So it's having that discipline to be able to, you know, end a contract in the case of FTR. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? or do you well, wanna... I think it helps for sure. It's just, again, if, I, if I'm a new business owner 
and I feel a financial pressure to say right. yes to every possible client. But when what's really best for my business is to say no to someone who's not a good fit. Yeah, yeah. How do thanks. I develop that mindset and discipline? Yeah, thanks, Corey. Um, yeah, I'll start off with uh, uh, an, a, again an FTR example. I had uh, somebody refer uh, somebody that uh, that owned three car dealerships, a high end car dealership. So first and foremost, it's it's really about understanding: can you help? Can you serve? And if you can't, find somebody who can. In this case, this uh, fellow that owned the three car dealerships, he didn't need FTR services. He needed marketing services. So I referred him over to uh, um, a, a marketing firm in my business group. Um, so it's having that discipline up front. Because if, if you don't and take them on as a client, you're only going to regret it because you're not going to be able to serve them. And it's going to damage your brand. Um, now to your point, I'm a startup or I'm a young company and you just want to get everything. Um, same rule applies. You can damage your brand. People talk, social media, social media is, <laughs> is social media as machine. you know. Um, and you know, sometimes, you know, you have to ha try and have that discipline at all times, but sometimes we slip. So we slip with uh, a client a couple of years ago where we took on a job where we, we really shouldn't have because um, the customer was you know had a very very tight budget uh, wasn't really in sync with solving the problem and it uh, ended up being a, a problem child client so uh, we use that as an example now today at our leadership meetings at this one client the you know, when we see one like this, when we see an opportunity like this, run. <laughs> no, we don't, don't literally. Do it. We don't literally run, but we we articulate that maybe we're not the ones to help you here today. Maybe you need to look look a little bit broader for somebody to help you with your with your problem here. So now this makes me thank you. This makes me think of two things. One's a pop culture reference. So I'm a big Christmas guy. I love Christmas and everything to do with it. And one Christmas movie I watch every year, both versions of it actually, is called Miracle on 34th Street. And just for purposes of anyone who hasn't seen the movies, there was one made back in the 1950s in black and white, and then one made again in the 1990s that was updated. But in both scenarios, we, it's like a tale of a war of department stores. And we have a department store that's about to go out of business. That if they don't make some really big sales at Christmas this year, they're done for. And then we've got this other department store that's doing really great and is trying to push these people out of business. In the newer version, in the 1990 version of this movie, Miracle on 34th Street, the struggling department store with the sort of, without spoiling it too much, an idea that comes from the guy that plays the Santa Claus at the store says, I have an idea. We don't have everything and we don't always have the best pricing. So when someone comes to Santa Claus saying, you know, I want this for Christmas and the Santa Claus is going to promise it to him, we're going to have this idea of saying, you know what, if we don't have it or if we don't have the right price, we're going to find it for you, even if it means sending you somewhere else. Right. And I know that's like a out of the blue, like pop culture reference, but I think it's very tied into what you said, which is... You bet. If we can't provide the product or service in a, a way that represents well the brand we want to, to portray, we probably are better off sending them even to a competitor if it means that that client's best needs are met. You bet. So that's the one thing. If you haven't seen the movie, it's probably worth watching just for that sort of like outside the box way of thinking about business. But again, not every sale is a good sale. And as Frank has said a couple times today so far, your brand, your reputation is is a lot, and it's hard to recover from a tarnished brand, a tarnished reputation. So you want to do anything and everything you can to protect that, and sometimes that means having an honest conversation with yourself and with your potential client that you'd love to help them, but for reasons X, Y, and Z that may be different in every case, you're not the best fit for what they need, but you know someone who is. That's and right. that second follow-up is also <clears throat> probably just as crucial and can also even make you look like a hero. Like, you know what? I know you came here hoping I could solve your problem. I'm honest enough to tell you that I can't. But I know someone who can. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And that, that started back when I was uh, you know, selling national accounts here in Edmonton over 20 years ago for ADP. Um, and... and 
you, you hear back several months, several years later, uh, that hey, you know, Frank Gannon or Corey was able to help help us three, four years ago. You know, he or she is a good person. You know, you should you should consider dealing with them. And the scenario that I was in is I I made an initial sales call at a company here in Edmonton, <clears throat> and clearly ADP was not in a position to help them. So I referred them to the SAP rep. Hmm. Yeah, because there's there's no point in engaging if you can't help, because yeah. it'll come out in the wash in the, in the next two, three, four, or five months, and then the brand takes a hit. So that reminds me of one other thing. Um, now, and you you as a salesperson, your reputation takes a hit. Yeah. So when I am interviewing for a potential employee, and I know we're not here to talk about employees, but there's a relevance here. I always am looking for someone who is asking questions back of me. Like they come to an interview and they think it's mostly just me as the potential hire going to ask, yeah. ask, 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 yeah. ask. And I'm really hoping that when they come to that interview, that they've come prepared with questions and they're going to interview me as well. Yes. And as backwards as that sounds, it's important that it's a two-way street there. It's a yes. two-way fit. And I, I tend to think of like a potential client fit the same way. I mean, you, when you bring someone in and you're like, okay, well, I got to tell you all about my stuff. And I got to tell you all about why you need my product and service. Mm. That's the temptation. But it would be way more effective and way better across for everyone if you ensure that there's equal speaking time there and you're learning as much about their need and their product or their problem as they are learning from you about how you think you can solve it. Um, and so hopefully those potential client meetings are also two-way streets where um, it's not just that you can do what they need, but they are a good fit for you as well. Like, so it's, it's a two-way street there. So I don't know, yeah. I'm, I'm not a sales guy, but that's right or wrong. That's how I try to approach things when I meet with a potential client is, yeah, I need to make sure I hear their side of the story as much or more than they're hearing my side of the story. Yeah, that's right. And um, you know, salespeople often have the gift of ga- the gift of gab, gift of the gab. <laughs> um, and any advice I would give to anyone early in their sales career or thinking they'd like to to have a professional sales career is listening is key. And you know, I reference a, a multi-step sales process. The first step of a sales process with any of our clients, and it goes back to the ADP days. You know, the first the first step is uh, you know, call it the first meeting, and it's the first meeting with the decision maker. In the case of ADP, it was you know the HR VP or the CFO, and the intent was to get them talking. What is the business problem that you have? And sitting there and active listening and taking notes. Mm-hmm. Um, so that you, at the end of your five or six step sales process, you can clearly ar- clearly articulate how you're going to solve those problems that the decision maker articulated in the first meeting. So, so, so closing the sale, it just happens naturally. Um, and then, you know, when you're proving value through that multi-step sales process, rarely does it become a pricing issue at the end, at the end of the process. There isn't this big negotiation on pricing. There might be something that's, you know, you need to tweak or lower or whatever or get creative with, but it's never a, it's never a scenario where you're being asked to, to reduce your, your price by 10, 20, whatever percent. It just naturally happens when you follow that sales process. Cool. Now, would <clears throat> it be, I don't want you to give away your secret sauce, as it were, but... Could you give us some even high-level insight into this sales process that you've alluded to a few times or anything that you could help point people listening in the right direction? Sure. Um, I'm going to use an example, okay. and uh, I hope we're okay on, on time. You're good. I'm going to use an example, a real live example of when I had left ADP and I was with this upstream oil and gas software company. Well. I got a call from a representative from Accenture Consulting, and he was in Dubai, and he was representing Saudi Aramco. Okay. So the largest oil and gas <laughs> company We're in the world. Small people there. So I conducted the first step, the 
the first meeting to understand what's the business problem. We did this obviously remotely <laughs> um, to understand the business problem. And then as we moved through the sales process, I was asked, well, the, the Aramco folks would like you to fly uh, to Saudi Arabia and demonstrate their software, demonstrate your software to them. And my response to the gentleman was, I, I, I can't do that. And he was like, it's Saudi Aramco. I'm, a, I'm from Accenture. You're just this, you know, you know, this upstream oil and gas, $20 million upstream oil and gas software company based in Calgary. Basically, how dare you? Mm -hmm. um, but I explained to him, here's why, or here's what we can do. If I have the opportunity, me and my team rather, I'm not taking all the credit here, uh, the, v the uh, vice president came along with me. Um, if we have the opportunity to interview and conduct a discovery se session with each and every person that's going to be touching and using this software on a daily basis, we'll fly over there all day long. But until I see that commitment, uh, that they're willing to do that, it's a non-starter. And here's why. Because we, we, we committed that sin in the past with a couple of companies in Houston, Texas. So we know if we don't conduct that discovery part with the key stakeholders as part of that sales process, we know if we don't get with all the key stakeholders, we're this not going work. to win. Yeah. So there's no point in me flying over there, uh, you know, 24-hour flight or whatever the heck it is, or a 24-hour journey, journey with a stop through, through Germany. There's no point in us doing it. So the short story is, the, the moral of the story is, they came back and reluctantly said, yes, you can meet with all these people. I put together a schedule. Uh, and met with all the people, and lo and behold, we did end up winning the business. Uh, because you followed your process, not, 100%. and not gave in to what they thought was yeah. should happen. Yeah, and it's it's really important as salespeople, or, or people running a, a business that's you know a small business, to explain the why. Why am I dragging you, or pulling you through this sales process? Because I'm clearly, I'm trying to clearly demonstrate how I can solve your business problem. If I come to you and just try and sell you software, there's just no point. And you know, we lived that pain with a couple of, <clears throat> pardon me, a couple of uh, similar smaller companies in Houston, Texas. Um, yeah, and I actually used that example with uh, the Accenture rep that. You know, we've lived this pain, we've committed this sin as I, as I cause it, because we underserve the client by not pulling them through a sales process. We're underserving them. Okay. So again, the need for a process, and by definition, once you have a process, it's important that you stick to and follow the process. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not really a process. That's and right. You have to and, keep running that process. And, and it doesn't matter what size a, a, a company you are, if you conduct a, 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 a post-sale or, or, or a, a loss debrief and you really dig into why did we lose, it's typically because we skipped a uh, part of our sales process or didn't get with a key stakeholder. Um, early on in my career at ADP, I'd go and meet with the CFO because I thought, oh, I'm going to hang with the CFO because that's the person that's going to sign my sales order. Um, but what I neglected to do on a couple of occasions, and I lost, the business is I didn't engage the, the payroll practitioner, the people that would actually be using the software on a daily basis. So they would come to the final presentation slash demonstration and go, wait, hang on a minute. Who is this guy? What is this? I haven't been engaged in this process. No way. We're, I'm not doing this. And often, you know, payroll practitioners have been with companies for 5, 10, 15 years. They're valued people. So you know, often they were, they ended up being the decision maker. Very good. Now you had alluded to earlier when you first, and we're introducing some of what you do, you had, when you first started FTR, you joined, and I think are possibly still part of a networking um, group. Um, probably multiple benefits of that. I yeah. know for me, I did something similar when I first started, I joined a networking group. And part of it's because I looked at myself and said, Corey, you're not good at sales. You don't like sales. You don't enjoy sales. Hmm. That's not your expertise. So you have a few options. But one is, is your ideal client going to find you because they found you in like a newspaper ad? Or is your ideal client going to come to you because someone they know and trust referred them? And I was pretty sure it was going to be the latter option. So mm -hmm. I wanted to find a 
organization or a networking type group I could be a part of mm -hmm. where I'm getting business because someone who's gotten to know me and trust me will send me their best client or their best friend or their family member that they, and by the time they've already gotten to you, it's almost yours to lose. That's right. Um, <clears throat> and so I would say to anybody that says, no matter how big you are, if you're just a one person operation, if you can uh, associate yourself or find a local chamber of commerce or a networking group you could join where you build these relationships of trust so that these people you get to know get to know you and therefore when they come across someone who they identify a need, needs that product or service you offer, you're, they're gonna, you're gonna be the one they think of and the person they sent to you is kind of, the sales part of it has already been done. Yeah. The, but. Once they come to you, it's still yours to try to, to lose if, if, or assess maybe if they're a good fit. And, and I'll give you an example. Um, I don't specialize in doing U.S. taxes. Um, I do some for myself, but I have never been trained to do them otherwise. And so sometimes in this kind of environment, I'll get referrals for someone saying, oh, I need U.S. taxes done. And someone say, oh, you should go see Corey and his firm. They, you know, he, he knows how to do that. It's true but I don't actually specialize in that. And so even though they want to use my services, again, it takes that in sort of integrity approach to be like, I appreciate it. I want to work with you. I can't serve what you need, yeah. but here's who can. Yeah, that's right. So that networking piece you talked about at the beginning has yes. not only been crucial for you, but I would say it would be a really great first step for anybody who's just starting out, or even if you haven't just started out, but you want to grow, Aligning yourself with some kind of organization like that could be a, a good option for you. Obviously, you could also consider hiring someone like Frank. Now, Frank, do you particularly primarily work with just really big companies or would you find yourself aligned with smaller one, two person operations if they felt that they could benefit from your services? Uh, so short answer is, is yes. I mean, uh, our typical sweet spot is companies that are uh, between a million and 30, 40 million in, in, in revenue is really that sweet spot. Um, you know, certainly, you know, we would work with a one to two uh, person company. Um, if, if, you know, if the, if the money's there, I mean, FTR does charge a fee. Um, if they can afford that fee, then absolutely we, we would, um, you know, my other consultant that uh, recently started with us, he's currently working out of a client's home. Okay. They're a small, yeah, they're a small company. <clears throat> Their revenues are, they're, they're north of a million dollars, but they don't have an office um, yet. In fact, they're moving in on Tuesday to their new office okay, nearby here, I believe. So, so short answer is yes, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, do they, can they afford to to, to pay for the service and you know we can get creative uh, often you know there's a you know a monthly fee with a you know with a bonus component attached based on FTR's performance I mean really at the end of the day you know we're focused on how we can help companies and people um, and 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 the the money naturally follows that so we're not maniacally focused on can we get a fee out of these folks it's can we help them and how can we get creative in terms of, you know, a, a fee or, a, or a, a model that works for them and for FTR, not always going to be the case, um, but that's really what we look at. We just we just don't take the approach of I want to sell you something. Just doesn't work. That's not how we how we roll at FTR. Well, and again, I didn't really know all those intricacies before I invited Frank on. But one of the things I've come to appreciate about Frank, even just during this conversation today, is that. He practices what he preaches, to use that proverbial phrase. He doesn't act one way and then teach his clients a different way. Like he, he's all in, he's all committed, he's um, integrated in what he, what he invites his clients to do and what he does himself. And so I definitely appreciate that. Now, Frank, if change topics slightly for just a moment, a company of any size, small, big, doesn't matter, um, are there... Are there metrics or ratios or other things that I could look at tracking in my business that might help me assess how well my company's doing? If I have an urgent need to grow my revenues, if I like, how would you suggest someone evaluate the revenue health of their company? Is there anything that you would suggest there? 
Well, um, the revenue health, well, obviously, um, looking at year over year growth, you know, putting a plan in place and driving towards a year, year over year growth metric. Um, you know, sales are important, but profitable sales are more important. Mm -hmm. So you can sell all you like. Uh, but if the, the, the sales line doesn't, you know, match up or is considerably better than the cost of goods sold cogs in your world, yeah. then there's no point in, there's no point in selling. So, um, really you have to keep an eye on, yes, the top line, uh, and then you have to keep an eye on the middle part, the money going out to your point, but more importantly is the bottom line, the net profit. Um, so we're not like myself, FTR, we're not, yes, sales is important and putting implement, implementing sales processes and systems are important, but they're all, they almost become meaningless if the bottom line profit isn't meaningful. So, so kind of then sort of in, unspoken implied in that would be a need for business owners of any size to know their numbers. That's right. Right. So it'd be really hard for whether Frank could help you or someone like Frank could come in and help your business grow your revenues to really assess the p effectiveness of that if you're not in a position to really know the numbers of your company. So you need to know the income, you need to know the gross profit of the different products and services you offer. You need to understand the costs that are going in, both direct and overhead. Those are things that you'll want to know. Now, if, if as a business owner that overwhelms you, I mean, you're in good company. Most, most business owners don't go into business because they think financial statements and knowing their numbers are a strong suit for them. But like as the case with so many other things, you surround yourself with people who can help you with that. You, you engage, yeah. you outsource, you hire professionals, whether they're internal employees or outsourced, who can help you with those pieces that are not your like, excelling point, but they're still crucial for you to know. And so we, I would invite you to, again, if, as another first step, as another step that you could take on your own, find a way dig into the numbers of your business, get to know it. Don't assume you know how much money you make from selling a certain product or service. Look at the numbers of what you actually are doing and compare how that might be to how you think in your head you're doing. And it actually might surprise you how different those are. And, and, and Corey, if I, if I may interrupt Please. you just for a moment, just going back to a, a business group, um, I think it's really important not only to get referrals, but it's also to interact with others in the business community and by definition of doing that you're demonstrating how you've solved problems and add value right um, but it's also about sharpening your skills in terms of presenting uh, in front of a in front of a group I know the local there's a couple of local business groups here in Edmonton where you you present once a once a month to 30 or 40 people in the room and that's important mm -hmm. not, not all people are good at it I'm not that fantastic at it to be honest um, but that's also another great, another great benefit of these these business groups to be out in the market. And you know, when a consultant comes and joins FTR, the first thing that I'm coaching them on is you need to be out in the market. Stop emailing people. <laughs> Stop using Zoom Teams. Go have a coffee and have a, a face-to-face face -face -face conversation. conversation. You've got to be out in the market. So wonderful. That's pretty good advice. Now, I had some really cool quotes I found. I might share a couple of them here in a okay. moment. Um, now, as has seeming to be the case with almost every episode of this show so far, there always seems to be some tie back into Stephen Covey. It's seven habits of highly effective people. And almost what topic we talk about, somehow <laughs> it just always seems to creep in to that topic. To that point, there was at least one that I found for relevant to today, um, but potentially a couple. Um, one from Stephen Covey was just, out of the seven habits, again, I'm referring to a book that he wrote called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I highly encourage you to read that and get to know what's in it. The fifth habit that he discusses in that book is called Seek First to Understand, Then to Be Understood. And so mm. often we go into whether it's a sales pitch meeting or a hiring meeting or we want to we think we found the, the girl or guy of our dreams and we're hoping they're going to agree to spend the rest of their life with us and we want to pitch a marriage proposal. We're so anxious to share our, our point of view and our perspective before we even know anything about them, before we even understand what their needs are. And so that concept of seeking to understand them 
And then as Frank has already said, that will sort of the, the sales part, the closing part of that sale will potentially happen organically by just really taking the time to get to know them first, to understand them first. Um, so again, kind of cool tie into Stephen Covey, but let me share some of these quotes and see how they resonate. And then I have a surprise for you, a good surprise for you, Frank. Okay. Because I, I remember I was talking about this before the podcast episode, and so I, I have a good surprise for you. So here's some of the quotes that I really liked. Here's one by Mary Kay Ash. I didn't look up who this is, but based on her name, I'm guessing she could be the founder of the uh, cosmetic company Mary Kay, but we'll see. Here's what she says. Pretend that every single person you meet has a sign around his or her neck that says, make me feel important. Not only will you succeed in sales, you will succeed in life. Now, I kind of like mm. that because, again, as you said, Frank, it's not about selling them something. It's about meeting a need. It's about meeting a, a thing that they have. And sometimes that need is like physiological. Uh, sometimes it's a need to realize themselves. Or, uh, there's a variety of needs that could meet, but you need to understand their needs there, as you said. Um, I like this one. Uh, I don't know who this is either. A lady named Jill Conrath says, you have to drop your sales mentality and start working with your prospects as if they've already hired you. And that might speak mm. to a confidence concept, a, a, a different approach um, on how you approach that. And then I love this one by Oprah Winfrey. And then I'll show you my surprise. Okay. Here's what she says. This isn't strictly about sales, but it's very much related to what we've talked about today. When you undervalue what you do, the world will undervalue who you are. And so we talked about pricing. How do you price your services and products that you're selling in your business? And when you when you are tempted and give into that temptation to price on the bargain basement level, if you want to be just a little bit cheaper than the next guy because you feel that's going to bring in all that extra you know clients you're hoping to land, um, it says something about when you when you <clears throat> price your goods or services. And if you price things low, maybe that suggests you don't think that you're worth that much. And I'm not sure that's always the message we want to convey. So I love that kind of like life uh, perspective concept that Oprah Winfrey brings up. If you undervalue what you do, the world will undervalue who you are. So I would, again, don't give into that temptation to underprice. Price what you're worth. Price your value. Clients who are a good fit for you, who are going to help you grow your business, or you're going to be a good long-term client, will see the value. They'll see beyond the price tricks. They'll see the value, and that value is important. So now, in talking to Frank about this episode beforehand, I threw him some of these quotes, and he's like, well, you know, these don't really speak to me. And then <laughs> he threw out names of two people who <clears throat> I think are more in line with who Frank gets his inspiration from. Um, I'm kind of putting words into his mouth, so I'm going to let him correct me in a minute if I'm wrong. But he threw out two names of people I had never heard of before. So I decided to look them up, and then I would like to give Frank a chance to tell us why, you know, who these people, a little bit more who these people are and why they're such an inspiration and um, model for him to follow. He mentioned a gentleman named Marcus Buckingham and a gentleman named John Cotter. I don't know if those are names any of you listening recognize. I didn't know them, but I looked them up um, just in preparation for this podcast episode, and they seem like amazing people. Um, from what I can tell, they both have written highly successful books. They go around um, booking like motivational speaking assignments. Um, <clears throat> A lot of them have to do with change and as what Frank would probably speak well to, process um, and leadership. So um, my surprise for you, Frank, is I have two quotes here that I found, from <laughs> one from um, Marcus and one from John. Before I read these quotes, though, maybe tell the people listening who, who these two people are, why they're inspirational to you, how they find their way in influencing what you do in your career. Yeah, um, so at a high level, I mean, Marcus was, you know, his material was uh, part of ADP University. Um, so ADP has a university. Okay. And we had to get so many credits per year to keep our saw sharpened. And, and Marcus and his material was a big part of that. So that's how I was introduced to Marcus Buckingham. His material resonates with me. I think he's uh, got a senior role in the ADP Institute. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the ADP Institute is now, <laughs> uh, but clearly you see that I still have quite an allegiance to ADP because on the professional side of my life, they made me, quite frankly. Um, 
then. So I, uh, I still have quite a, quite an attraction and a connection to ADP. Um, I'd like to spend more time with, with on Cotter though. Uh, Cotter, um, I was introduced to his material through my MBA. Okay. Uh, final paper you know what that's like uh-huh. uh so he his chain his organizational change theories and uh processes really really resonated with me and the biggest uh, because the the biggest thing that i take away from john carter's material is that uh change isn't just a one a one-time thing so if you're going to implement change in a company yes at first it's going to be painful uh, but if you follow these multi, multiple steps, I think John's got nine or ten steps, um, you know, change will continue to trickle in in a company and continue on like an IV drip of change and people won't even feel it. So okay. that's really what resonated with me. And, and, you know, he talks about the notion of people looking back, you know, after going through a major organizational change and then having smaller change continue over the course of years. He references people that look back and went, oh my gosh, we sure went through a lot of change. I didn't really even, you know, notice it. But no, I like his, I like his uh, philosophy and um, implementing an organizational change strategy. So that's, that's what he calls it, not change management, because it's an organizational change strategy, yeah. not change management. Um, and the notion of, of, of creating a guiding coalition, uh, people to go out and evangelize the change that the organization wants to implement and uh, you know, re- uh, celebrating wins uh, vis-a-vis the change you're implementing and uh, also you know, coaching and communicating people in the organization that here's what's not going to change. So don't get too freaked out about the change that's coming. <laughs> here's what's not going to change. It's going to be all good. And then people tend to... Prepping them. Yeah, they tend to take a deep breath and go, okay, okay, I'm open to this. So, um, yeah, so... Okay, so I'm going to read my two quotes. They don't necessarily directly deal with sales, but I feel that they might speak to you. Now, I, I looked through several quotes, and I, there were several that I could have picked from, but these two, maybe I, I'll just say they spoke to me. Um, okay. Even in a non-sales context, just they really made me think. I had like some aha light bulb moments. So I'll start with Marcus Buckingham's one. It's short. Okay. It's profound, I think, if we wanted to dive into it, which we won't dive into it too much into the podcast today. But just I really want you to think about this and feel free to look this gentleman up. His name is Marcus Buckingham, has been said. Here's his quote. The difference between a pebble and a mountain lies in whom you ask to move it. And I read that and I was like, huh, that's pretty profound. Mm-hmm. Perspective and confidence and a variety of things you could probably dive into. But I really appreciated that made me think moment when I read that quote from Marcus. It's a little bit longer one, but since he seemed to be one you were more interested in. Um, here's one from John Cotter. By the way, I don't know exactly what it is in, but it looks like from what I could read that John Cotter has a doctorate in something. They referred to him as Dr. John Cotter and everything that I was looking at. So I don't know if it's a business doctorate or a, I don't know what it is, but he's yeah, super he's, smart and educated in some degree. He's, uh, I think he's still at Harvard uh, today. You may have noticed that in your research prior to the podcast. Yeah. But uh, yeah, anyways, I apologize. For no, no apology. So here's what, <clears throat> here's what I found that I really liked from him. It says, motivation and inspiration energize people, not by pushing them in the right direction as a control mechanism does, but by satisfying basic human needs for achievement, a sense of belonging, recognition, self-esteem, a feeling of control over one's life, and the ability to live up to one's ideals. Such feelings touch us deeply and elicit a powerful response. And the main thing I thought of when I heard that quote was something I learned back in university, going back to what I think was called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Right. And... For those who aren't familiar with it, it's a little kind of pyramid-shaped idea that we have these most basic fundamental needs, air, water, shelter. And then once we have those basic needs set, then we're able to concentrate on a higher level of needs. And I don't remember the order of everything, but towards the top of this multi-level needs pyramid is what are termed as your self-actualization needs. That's right. So I think that's what John Cotter is referring to, your your sense of achievement, your sense of belonging, your sense of self-esteem. Those are all things that... Like, you're not going to die from a 
physically living on as a human being perspective, hence the basic level of needs. But once those needs are met, you focus on the top level needs. And maybe just as important when you look at that is no one's going to focus on those top level needs until those basic needs are met. And so again, taking the time to understand what your potential client wants is crucial because they don't give a crap about how um, how well they're going to feel when they take this from a, a mindset perspective if they're not getting their basic needs met. Right? And so again, when you're looking for how to help people, how to sell to people, or even just products or services, look for where you can meet people's needs and their basic needs are always going to be first. So that's kind of what it made me think of. I don't know your thoughts on either one of those two quotes or if you want to spend any time on them, but what, uh, any thoughts on those two quotes? Yeah, um, no, no, no further thoughts. Um, you know, I'm, you know, a big fan of John Carter. So uh, was, I frankly hadn't read that quote. So okay. <laughs> I appreciate you bringing it forward. And Corey, just through, you know, listening to you here for the last couple of minutes, um, I think there's one thing I'd really like to, to leave with your audience. And that is, is that, you know, when we're seeking to solve a problem, um, we become less salesy. Uh, now, in your notes, part of the, the podcast, you referred to a, a term as salesy. If we're seeking to help a, uh, a person or a company solve a problem, that salesiness goes away. Uh, if that makes sense, it makes complete like sense. Like if you, like if I come to you and I'm trying to sell you, if I'm trying to sell you something versus solving a business problem, I'm I'm saying whatever I think that you want to hear. I'm sucking up to you, but if I take a different approach and think about how I can help uh, solve a problem of Corey's, and having and establishing what I call equal business stature, okay. right, versus a sales guy to a decision maker. Like you're all, you're automatically, if you're taking a sales guy approach, you're automatically on a lower step. Yeah. Yeah. But if you, you know, seek to establish equal business stature, the conversation and and solving the problem and winning the business is, it it takes a completely different uh, path, if that makes sense. And, and um, there's no harm in, in putting that out to the decision maker. In other words, Corey, I'm here to help help you solve a business problem. I want to have some you know meaningful discussion with you. And you know what? I might not be able to help you solve your business problem. I may not be able to. I'm not here to sell you stuff. I'm here to help you solve your business problem. And if I can't, I'll look for somebody that can. And that automatically, if you're somebody in, you know, if I'm selling to you or back in my ADP days as CFO, it totally puts them at ease mm-hmm. and goes, okay, that's refreshing. And this isn't another sales guy trying to sell me stuff. They're actually in earnest, interested in helping me solve my problem. Yeah, and then they take their defenses away. That's right. And you can actually have heart to heart. Yeah, that's right. And Corey, I'll report back to you what I'm finding as I'm meeting with the key stakeholders in your organization. I'll report back to you how I'm making out. But this is what my process looks like. And here's the why. Cool. I have a good friend of mine. I've always been jealous of what I called his natural sales personality because he's the kind of guy that will have not only not hate, but thrives on going door to door and introducing himself to random people he doesn't know <laughs> and trying to you know, see if they could use the product or service he's happened to representing at that moment in time. And I was like, I'm so jealous that you have this personality or you just have no problem going to people and just you know, having these random conversations, like I don't have that personality type. And it used to bother me that I felt that way. I'm like, oh, there must be something wrong with me because I just didn't get that gene where I'm comfortable (laughs) selling to people, right? My gut now after talking to you suggests that he just had learned what you've taught us over the last hour, which is it's not about selling. It's about helping. It's about solving. It's about meeting people's needs and anybody could have a conversation about that. Yep, 100%. So I, I'm still jealous of his personality, but I think he had learned a long time ago something that I'm just now probably figuring out, which is that concept. So I guess the reason I mention that is anyone listening, there's probably, if you don't feel like you're the sales personality, if you just weren't born with that type of 
personality and you're like, well, I'm just going to have a disadvantage in my business venture because I just don't know how to sell to people. I just don't have that personality. That yeah. could actually be a really good thing because it might force you to focus on yes. what Frank has said, which is good. Don't have that salesy personality. Have a, I want to help people person. And I think you, I think you, you hit the nail on the head because I think you do solve problems. You solve problems for me. Um, so, uh, I, th I think you really nailed it there and I'll tell you something. Uh, often I'll say to people, you know, I tell people, uh, you know, on a plane or at a cocktail party or whatever, what I do and they go, you're in sales? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I am. And then I go on to explain to them, you know, sales is this and there's a huge operational component to sales, right? Uh, and if you think about, and when I say that, if you think about selling whatever, software, lumber, whatever the case may be, there's a real operational element, and that is you can sell all you like, but if the back end can't implement it within the business, you're screwing up the business. Mm -hmm. So this notion of I'm a sales guy and I sell and I talk fast and all this stuff, that is 1940s and 50s uh, <laughs> mentality. Uh, so people are, are, are often very surprised when I tell them I'm in, I'm in the, I'm a sales professional because I don't come across as that guy. So people like Frank are helping to change that stereotype, and I think that's a great thing for all of us. Frank, I want to thank you for joining us here in our podcast today. I think you have taught us well and given us some great insights, some things to think about and consider, uh, some answers to some commonly approached questions and issues that um, a lot of business owners, especially newer ones, but anyone really would face and the dilemmas they face in their business, particularly as we talked about today as it relates to growing the income and the revenue and the sales side of business. So I want to thank you for coming on. We kind of alluded to this earlier, but um, if someone wants to get a hold of you, either they want to ask you a question or maybe they want to engage your services or they just want to learn more about you, how, what's the best way for them to do that? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, firstly, I would encourage um, folks to go to FTR's uh, website. Uh, there's a contact page there. Um, certainly happy to share my email address. It's a long one. What? No, but is it on your website? It's on my website. So just as maybe well. give everyone the website address. Yeah, it's just ftrsalesconsultants.com. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> it's pretty simple, and and you'll notice that the website is pretty simple. What? And that's intentional, because the intent is to get a face to sit face to face meeting with potential clients to uncover what the business problem is or the need is so that we can clearly demonstrate how to how to solve it. So we're not trying to sell stuff on a website. Wonderful. Well, as I said, I'm grateful to Frank for joining us today. I'm grateful to all of you listening or watching. I appreciate you tuning into our podcast today. Again, this has been the Business Speak podcast. I'm your host, Mr. Chill. Thanks again to Frank Gannon for joining us today. Have a wonderful day, everyone. See you later. You've been listening to the Business Speak podcast featuring Mr. Chill. Be sure to subscribe and add us to your podcast library to ensure you never miss an episode. We love hearing from our listeners. If you have a topic or question you'd like us to discuss, would like to be a guest on our show, or would otherwise like to get in touch with us, please visit our website at businessspeak.ca. Thanks for listening to Business Speak, the language of business simplified simplified